lives here in London. Tomorrow, the two remaining seeded American men players will be in their quarterfinal matches. John McEnroe against Mats Wielander and Tim Mayotte taking on defending champion Stefan Edberg. We'll have our regular coverage beginning at 5 Eastern and Pacific time. Now for Billie Jean King, Arthur Ashe, Barry McKay, and Larry Merchant, I'm Jim Lampley. Good night. The executive producer of HBO Sports and producer of Wimbledon is Ross Greenberg. The coordinating producer was Rick Bernstein, who brandishes his political muscle in every meeting. Twice before, his smashing style has carried this election. Once again now, the bookmaker's constituents place his name atop the public opinion polls. And there's the House Whip, John McEnroe, whose political instincts and fearlessness generate heat on both sides of the aisle. The issues are sharply in focus. The intensity of the debate is building. The galleries will again be jammed as men's quarterfinal day arrives in the Parliament of Wimbledon. at Wimbledon brings only a few clouds in the sky, but a quick and hastening breeze. A thousand can jam the grounds of the All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club, and thousands more wait outside on the streets looking for the rare stray ticket, as eight men prepare to narrow to four in search of the world's most prestigious tennis prize. Hello again, I'm Jim Lampley, along with Arthur Ashe, as we welcome you back to HBO's 15th anniversary coverage of Wimbledon. Men's quarterfinal day, Arthur, and speculation rampant here in town as to who is going to win the tournament. Once again, the overwhelming choice, as was the case last year, of bookmakers and bettors is the sports premier knockout artist, Boris Becker. Well, Jim, I do not disagree. His power has been such that so far in this tournament, he has won the equivalent of three and a half sets with unreturnable shots. The ball just simply did not come back. In fact, he is the only quarterfinalist here so far who has yet to lose a set. And Becker has been so spectacular again that again, Stefan Edberg, last year's defending champion, has sneaked through to the quarterfinal almost incognito. Now today he faces a very interesting match against Tim Mayotte of the United States, who is in the quarterfinals for the sixth time in his career. Well, Stefan Edberg, I think, is a slight question mark. He seems to be the most vulnerable of the top four seeds, but he has won 23 of 28 matches in his Wimbledon career, so he knows how to play on the grass. All right, Arthur, let's look at the draw from top to bottom. And in the top half of the draw, you see two seeded players against unseeded players. Lendl against Goldie at the top, and then Becker against Paul Chamberlain, who has gotten this far without facing any player ranked in the top 100. Below that, in the bottom half of the draw, all four seeded players. Number five, John McEnroe, against number four, Mats Wielander, and number eight, Tim Mayotte, against Stefan Edberg, seated number two. Two of the matches will take place on center court, starting with John McEnroe, 30 years old and in search of his fourth Wimbledon championship, against Mats Wielander, who of course has never won this title, but has won all three other Grand Slam championships. And following that, Stefan Edberg, the defending champion, seated number two this year, playing Tim Mayotte, a man who many believe has the game to win here, but hasn't gotten it done in the past. Court one, the number one player in the sport, Yvonne Lendl, in search of the one Grand Slam title that he's never won, playing Dan Goldie, whom you will remember as the man who knocked Jimmy Connors out of the tournament. And that will be followed by the match between Boris Becker and Paul Chamberlain, in which Becker is, of course, an overwhelming favorite to win. Arthur and I will be focusing our attention on center court, and we'll start with the Wielander and McEnroe match. And I said the other day, Arthur, this match pits two players of extraordinary talents and historic backgrounds, both of whom have big question marks hanging over their heads. Well, they certainly do. John McEnroe so far has been a contender on court and very contentious off court. As you can see, he's born in Wiesbaden, West Germany, which surprises a lot of people, now lives in New York age 30. This may be his last best chance to win the tournament here. Tw 77 career wins. Had a very difficult first round match against the Australian Darren Cahill. Prevailed 8-6 in the fifth. Richie Rinnenberg on court one gave him another tussle 7-5 in the fourth set. Then Jim Pugh, relative 
Easy match for John McEnroe. And then the very contentious one, John Fitzgerald, back on court one, 6-4 in the fourth. And Mats Wielander, the question mark there is, is he motivated? Well, so far he's done not too badly at all. Age 24, born in Boxio, Sweden, now is a neighbor of mine in Greenwich, Connecticut. Won 32 tournaments, and let's see how he got to the quarterfinals. First round, his fellow Swede, Magnus Gustafsson, 6-2 in the third. Karol Novacek of Czechoslovakia, relatively easily. Jason Stoltenberg, the young Australian, 6-3 in the third, very easy. And Christo Van Rinsberg, South Africa, 6-3 in the fourth set. So, here we have it. Almost always the case, controversy surrounds John McEnroe as this match begins. Vilander, the quieter of the two competitors, both of them very anxious to win here at Wimbledon. And we turn our attention now to McEnroe Vilander on center court. As we go there, it is 5-5 in the first set. John McEnroe serving. Yeah, they've just been trading pawns here. <laughs> That's right. The bishops, knights, rooks, and queen will come later. John has excellent balance when he moves and he back pedals almost as well as anyone. One of the reasons he's such a good doubles player, he climbs all over the net, but everybody knows that if you hit a lob over his head, he's pretty quick going back. So is Becker. 15 pounds heavier, but great feet. Pedals. Yes. It doesn't look like it. It looks clumsy going back, but he gets there. <coughs> Either would succeed in a variety of other sports. Maybe not the same sports for the two, but they could play. Ooh. That's not such an unusual passing shot for Mats Wielander. That's normal for him. 15 off. Now John's going to slide this forehand cross court or down the line, rather, and didn't cover the returning angle. Neither player, Jim, is entirely comfortable with their racket situation right now. You, you notice there's not a stencil in the racket of John McEnroe or Mats Elander. And Mats, I think, is fiddling around with some other combinations. You say that neither player has a stencil on the racket for the uninitiated. That means that they are not too anxious to be publicly identified with the brand of racket that they're playing. Right. Otherwise, you w we would know about it. That's the kind of return I talked about a game and a half ago. That's a confidence builder. Yes, you win the point, but this strikes fear in your opponent's heart. Whereas if you just lost the point with, say, a forced error, it wouldn't have the same psychological effect. Pace between points slowing just a little bit now as we reach the end stages of a first set, which may be headed toward a tiebreaker. If both men can hold service one more time.
Well, John was playing cat and mouse in the role of the cat, and the roles were reversed. Mats will come up, go down the line. John will reflex across court. Mats, with his quick feet, we've talked about those pair of legs. He got to it, slid it down the line. And it sets up a potentially critical break point for Mats Vilander. His fifth break point of the set. He has broken McEnroe twice before. Most importantly, in game nine, when John was trying to serve the set out, leading 5-3. Now, this is a different sort of breakpoint advantage than one that you'd have when the score is, say, 2-all or 1-2. This is a big breakpoint opportunity. Because it could set up Belander with his chance Correct. to serve out the set. And as John waits for... Whomever. Or whatever. Some distraction to dissipate. He broke in game eight. Had a chance to serve the set out in game nine. Belander broke back. Double fault. And as John's service motion fails him in the clutch, we take a look back, Arthur Ashe, 12 years to 1977 when McEnroe came here as a Stanford freshman and became the first player ever to make it out of the qualifying tournament to the semifinal. Here's how he served then. He was facing the net a lot more than he does today, and the backswing on his serve was much shorter. He came past the knee, up to the shoulder and around. And now, he is away from the net a bit more. And the racket almost touches the ground before it comes up onto the shoulder and around. First thing you see is that the stance is dramatically different. That sets up the entire motion. Now, here is John's first serve percentage so far in the tournament. He's been nothing if not consistent and simply, in your view, Arthur, not good enough. No, not good enough. Uh, John ordinarily is about on grass, in the high 60s, maybe low 70s. Today, he's 45%. That ain't gonna cut it against Mats Wieland. Time. So you would predict that if John McEnroe continued to serve at this efficiency level for the entire match? Problems. And Wielander is trying to make it past the quarterfinal round for the first time in his eight visits to Wimbledon. Interesting that this is the seventh straight year Mats Wielander has been seated in the top five here. That's a tribute to his accomplishments everywhere else in the game because he's never gone past the quarterfinal here. He's trying to justify his high seating for the first time in his career at Wimbledon. What a difference a year makes for Wielander. A year ago, he came here 25 and 5 in matches. This year, he's 13 and 10. And has been beaten by relatively ordinary players. Well, that's about the fourth swinging cross-court topspin backhand volley we've seen from McEnroe, and he's won them all. No reprieve now for McEnroe. He has to break back or else. If he breaks back, he forces a tiebreaker. Only in sets one through four. If this goes to a fifth set, no tiebreakers. Wielander guessed right, and I think because in this match so far, John has yet to hit a backhand down the line for a winner in a passing shot situation. McEnroe hasn't dropped the first set of a match in this tournament since his extraordinary five-set thriller with Darren Cahill in round one. Of course, in that match, he dropped the first two sets and came back to win. John paid the price for being so close to the baseline. 
He likes to play close in on grass, but that was a very deep first volley. And his only alternative was to try to hit a winner from a half volley situation that deep in the court. The only one we've seen been able to do that this year very well is Michael Chang. This is the 13th career battle between McEnroe and Vilander. Each has won six times. Vilander <laughs> there paid the price for opening up the court. He had been very successful going down the middle. He decided, now I'm going to go over to the corner, open the court up. John McEnroe steps in. Whistles at cross court for a winner. Quiet, please. Thank and look you. where he is. He's two yards inside the baseline. That tells you how short Vlander's second serve has fallen. Vlander has broken McEnroe three times in the set. Now John tries for his third service break against Mott. And gets it. Third time in nine chances that John McEnroe has converted a break point. So in a seesaw first set, they now go to a tiebreaker. This first set is now more than an hour old. These are two men who are no strangers to long matches with each other. Once in a Davis Cup tie in St. Louis, they played on carpet. With Arthur Ashe watching at courtside as Davis Cup captain for six hours, 39 minutes, costing everyone their flight home. <laughs> Talk about pressure. That was the match that decided the Davis Cup tie, was it not, Arthur? Yes. It was 2 all that day. Gottfried had lost to Anders Yarrett. Just a reminder, in case you're relatively new to tennis or the format has slipped your mind, this is the 12-point tiebreaker format. First man to reach seven points with a two-point lead is the winner. Again, Mott's with success going down the middle, forced John to literally get out of the way. Looked like a cricket batter who would have been put out LBW, as they say over here. That's the tactic which has begun to work for Vlander, serving right at McEnroe to limit his stroke options. What will John try to do here, Arthur? Uh, I don't know. I don't think John knows either. when you're serving at a 45% first serve rate, you shouldn't get too terribly strategic. Well, what you don't want to do is let it fall short. If you're going to get it in that infrequently, make sure it's deep when you do get it in. He's just not firing that first ball, though, that's for sure.
right in the corner. They'll change ends with no breather. Of course, anytime you see John McEnroe in a tiebreaker in a pressure match at Wimbledon, you hearken back to 1980 and the fourth set of his titanic struggle with Bjorn Borg. A tiebreaker won by McEnroe in the match eventually won by Borg en route to his fifth consecutive Wimbledon championship. Easily the most famous tiebreaker in the history of the tiebreaker. The one that defined the genre. Right. Ooh. That one slipped away. Three, Villander. Now, at this stage in the tiebreaker, eighth point, John's 45% first serve efficiency. Quiet, please. Thank you. Could be a factor. And I don't think it goes unnoticed that John just uttered what many regard as one of the vilest expletives in the English language, loudly and demonstratively at center court. Barely audible, but read lips. Trouble. See the wind blowing Vilander's hair. That's a strong indication of what kind of day it is there on the court. Terrific first volley from McEnroe on the backhand side. Vilander content, really not to go for the lines on his return, just get it in thinking that John may be nervous enough to make an error. But this is a bread and butter shot for John. Best backhand volley since Tony Roach. And the best forehand volley since? Uh, I would, Dennis Ralston, Jack Kramer. Uh, John Newcomb. John Newcomb, yes. Those are your classic forehand volleys. Again, Mats Vilander chose to go right down the middle. A little amazed, he seems almost afraid to go for the lines the way John does. Could be waiting for John to self-destruct. Yes, but uh, I just thought that Matt would have, at this stage, when he gets a service that shallow in the court, he would go for it a bit more. But no, he was playing it safe. No question about that. He was playing it safe. Oh, yeah. Ooh, John thought that ball was a fault. But Richard Kaufman in the chair is not going to overrule anything unless it's crystal clear that a mistake was made. And these officials out here, as everyone would expect, are among the best in the world at what they do. Telltale signal as we listen to this Delander. is that we didn't hear the electronic eye go off. It did look doubtful, but we didn't hear the beep go off. They were both close. So many variables on a grass court at the end of a two-week tournament like this, are Quite line please. calls one of the things that are difficult? Yes, you always hope that in the exciting part of a match, end of a set, end of a match, no mistakes are made. Well, that was a nervous forehand for Mats Vilander. That is a bread and butter shot for him. And now 
12 points into the tiebreaker. They will change over again. Mats is more nervous now than I've seen him in a long time. Right, please. Thank you. Well, Perhaps. it's been a long time since he's been involved in a, a match of this situation. You're right. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. Not since the United States Open nine months ago has Wielander been at this level of the game. If you watch the shot, not much to say. John guessed right. Cut it off at the pass. Literally. Right, please. Thank you. Set yeah. point for John Thank McEnroe. You. you also wonder if there's an adjustment for Vilander to the feeling of caring about winning. And he himself admits that it has been absent from his character for a while. wants to hit a forehand, because if he does, he can wind up coming back to the middle of the court. And it works. So in a nervous, tense tiebreaker, it is Wielander whose nerves crack most. And John McEnroe, in a set in which his service was broken three times, manages to come out on top. McEnroe got away with squandering an opportunity to serve out the set because Wielander couldn't do it either. And we mentioned the famous tiebreaker between McEnroe and Borg in 1980. If you're a tennis fan and saw it, surely you can visualize some of those dramatic moments in your head. It was the 1816 tiebreaker, the one which, as Arthur mentioned, virtually defined the genre. Borg lost the tiebreaker to McEnroe, went on to win the match. 1-6, 7-5, 6-3. 6786 to notch his fifth consecutive Wimbledon championship. So now with another tiebreaker victory, John McEnroe takes a one-set advantage over Mats Wielander, and we turn our attention to the sometimes tortoise-like approach of the world's number one player, Ivan Lendl, toward a potential fifth straight trip as far as the semifinals here at Wimbledon. Over on court number one, Lendl is involved in his quarterfinal match against American outsider Dan Goldie, the young man who knocked off Jimmy Connors earlier in the tournament. They've met three times before, and Lendl has won all three. Side of cross court. Shots ever. 15 off. McEnroe's backhand volley, cross court. Very little backswing. Almost effortless. There must come a moment when the ball leaves your racket on the return when you just know that he's there and that's what he's going to do and you have set him up for it. Now I expect, even though Mots is over there in the doubles alley, he may slide around his backhand, hit the forehand down the line. Well, he went around his backhand, but he hit the forehand down the middle. And John hit a great reflex half volley just over the net, and it died. And this is the pattern which obtained throughout the first set, hitting the ball down the middle instead of going for the lines.
30 off. Now, as we look at a replay, Jim, the best way of looking at this next point is that Mats Wielander is two points away from serving for the second set. That's the way John McEnroe is thinking about it. Making this match two points, virtually dead even. First service. Of course, that reminds me, Arthur, that both players had chances to serve for the first set. And neither could take care of that particular task. Thus, they went to the tiebreaker. Well, I'm amazed that John isn't double faulting more now in this win when his first serve is so far off. If you're close to the line, that's one thing, but he's missing by a foot. That was a forced volley here by John McEnroe from Mott's V-Lander. Forced how? The second serve fell about two yards inside the service line. Why, please. And Matt's, as we Thank saw, you. hit one of the most forceful returns he's hit in this entire match, cross court. And John just couldn't handle it. Break point for Wielander. So not only is John's first serve percentage not high, his second serve is starting to fall short. Wielander trying for the ninth service break of the match. There were six of them in the first set alone. The key here now, let's see where the ball hits the ground on John's second serve. That will tell what Mott will do. Sizzling forehand return, service break for Wielander at a critical moment. And now it is the Swedish star leads five games to three. with a chance to serve for the second set. Even things up at one apiece with McEnroe. As we see, the ball hits the ground about a yard and a half inside the service court. Quiet, please. And as we said, Thank you just don't do that against Mats Wielander. Ad knows you and get away with it. And there break were points. the statistics on break points. Wielander 5 of 10, McEnroe 4 of 11. An astonishing nine service breaks already. They have not completed the second set. John McEnroe trying very hard to give Wielander opportunities with his first serve failures. Can Mott's take advantage? Fifteen left. That was a chancy second serve from Mott's Wielander. And it surprised John. He didn't expect the ball to go there. I think he thought it was going down the middle or to his forehand. Because he has the same sense you have of how Wielander has played so far in the match. Right. umpire Richard Kaufman from Seattle, Washington. Triple set point. Quiet, please. Thank you. This is a 2 out of 3 set match with fatigue as a factor. 
And after a one hour and 10 minute first set, Mats Wielander wrapped up that second set in 43 minutes. So for the moment, the McEnroe Wielander pace is quickening. Meanwhile, we're going to go back over to court number one to see what's happened. Set six three. That put him up two sets to one over Mats Wielander. Now in the fourth set, they have once again traded service breaks. And they're even on serve with McEnroe Why, serving at Thank two you. three. As we return to center court. We pick it up right, now, please. three hours, 27 Thank minutes you. into the match. They are on serve. In the fourth set, John McEnroe serving to get level at 3-3 and leading two sets to one. Fifteen left. There is also a temptation now, Jim, to take shortcuts. Because I don't care who you are, you play three and a half hours, you feel it. And shortcuts are easier to take on the backhand side. You can hit them a bit more lazily with underspin. Not too much effort. Equally as much a problem for the two-handed backhand of Wielander as for the one-handed backhand of John no, McEnroe. I was going to say, that is one of the disadvantages of a two-handed shot. You really cannot cheat with two hands. You've got to get over there, plant the back foot, push off. If you don't do that, 15 off. the two-handed shot's going to be relatively ineffective. Of course, on the forehand side, both players hit their forehands, although differently, with open stances, which is one way of cheating as far as classical approach to teaching Tennis 101, so to speak, is concerned. John McEnroe, in particular, is sometimes so almost supernaturally efficient on his strokes that he seems to get by with less foot movement than other players. Yes. John has another 30, 15. built-in, innate, inborn advantage. He has tremendous tremendous court sense and so what some people see as tremendous foot speed is in reality terrific anticipation uh, John has a bit of both first service well by the same token when he was at his peak a year ago and winning three Grand Slam tournaments other players and McEnroe was one of them would say of Bielander nobody sees the ball like Mats. Nobody sees it coming off the racket as quickly, sees the spin, sees where it's going to go, like Mats Wieland. I have heard that. Well, it's one thing to see it, and it's also another thing to do something with it when, when, you get, when it gets to you. Uh, John is the kind of player who makes contact with the ball in front of his body. Mats Wielander makes contact with the ball on the forehand and the backhand on the side. So John actually hits the ball about nine inches to a foot in front of where Mats Wielander makes contact. And John can do that because, as I've said so many times here, and everybody else has said, his backswing is very short. His timing is out of this world. question about that forehand volley, two of which in this match he has missed at very crucial times. Three games off. Level at three games apiece in set number four. John McEnroe won the first set tiebreaker after they had traded six service breaks equally in the first set. Wielander got a service break in the second set and rolled to a 6-3 victory. Wielander went up a service break in set number three. Had a chance to go up two service breaks. Squandered it. Saw McEnroe break back and then break again and win that set 6-3. And they have traded service breaks again in set number four. 
It has been a seesaw battle. Total of 14 service breaks in the match. You see there Number evidence 30. wherein John McEnroe would have probably took that off for a winner. That reflex forehand volley for Mats Wielander was something he had to think about. Not being a natural volleyer, Wielander has a bit more difficulty with those situations. John McEnroe, champion here at Wimbledon, 1981, 1983, 1984. Mats Wielander in his eighth visit to Wimbledon, never passed the quarterfinal. Well, you don't often see a, a ground stroke winner when both players are at the baseline, but you just saw one. You do see it when Boris Becker's playing. And that's the one player, Jim, that I worry about if John were to win this match and get through to the final to play Boris Becker, and that's the only way they could play. If he hits his serves short against Boris Becker, he's going to pay one hell of a price. Because Becker's natural style of play is to go for it and go for the lines. And he's strong enough to do it. Indeed, John, so far in the tournament, the sole exception of Darren Cahill in the opening round has played a series of counterpunchers. And Becker is the premier power puncher in the sport. The Mike Tyson of tennis. Yeah. Folks, that's not easy to do. <laughs> but Bielander leaning toward the line. Yes, he did. And John loves to hit that shot. A full run. Try, please. Why, please. Thank you. And Wielander had to stay where he was because John just as easily could have gone down the line. Yet another break point. Fifteenth service break of the match. Third service break of this fourth set. And it puts John McEnroe in position to perhaps go ahead and run out the set, if he can play efficiently in the next three games, and move toward the semifinal round. McEnroe's last championship here came in 1984, winning one of the most devastating final round performances in the history of the tournament. He knocked off Jimmy Connors, who had beaten him in the final two years before. 6-1, 6-1, 6-2 the last and most impressive of McEnroe's three Wimbledon championships. Impressive because it was architected on sheer skill. It came just a few weeks after he had wilted. You look at the Duchess of York as she sits in the royal box. And it would appear from that picture, Arthur Ashe, that the Princess of Wales has either exited the royal box for some kind of temporary break. Yes, she has been um, sitting to uh, the Duchess of York's right was Buzzer Addingham, the Chamberlain of Wimbledon. Sitting to his right was the Duke of Kent. Well, of course, it could be that the princess has simply gone out to freshen up and is headed back later to see some more tennis. I think she's headed back to Buckingham Palace. So John McEnroe, having just scored a service break to go up. Quiet, please. Thank you. Thank you. 4-3 in the fourth set, already leading two sets to one. Has a chance now to put some heat on Mats Wielander if he can hold serve and get to within one game of winning this quarterfinal match. We've talked so often during this event, especially yesterday, when Golarsa was playing Everett toward the end, when she had 5-2 in the third, she had to close out the match. You're looking at one of the best closers in the business right here, John McEnroe. Having said Love that, <laughs> I started to say, even now with his balky serve continuing to bother him, 
Would he be one of the best closers in the business? Still is. Oh, yes. No matter what. The record indicates that, yes, once he gets ahead, he puts you away. Exception of the 84 French Open final. He got tired. Well, as I was referring to a few moments ago, one of the things that was so impressive about his Wimbledon win in 84 is that there were already questions about his stamina and his physical condition as a result of his five-set loss to Lendl in the French Open final three weeks before. Chance for Belander now to try to set up double break point. And for John, a chance to establish a streak of confidence and good points that will carry over into his next semifinal encounter. Double break point. 15 40. Psychologically, John would come off the court, even if he won, feeling a lot better if he ran Twice, the streak out right now, Thank you. rather than had to limp across the finish line and face Mayotte or Edberg day after tomorrow. John now taking every bit of the 30 seconds allotted in which to launch this serve. service break for Max Wielander. Chance now to get back level on serve in the fourth set. This has been a match for purists. There certainly uh, it's been Quiet, devoid please. of any sustained brilliance on the part of either player with all Ladies those service breaks. Quiet, please. Thank you. There have even been a few and far between brilliant points. How many service breaks? 16. Just wide. 15 love. And you used the chess analogy about two sets ago, and I think that's a very apt description now, summing up the match this far. Yes, but at this particular quality of play, not Fisher versus Spassky. <laughs> no. Or Kasparov, C or one of those. Certainly not, no. Fifteen off. Back and row sliding behind his backhand, coming to the net, knifing off that backhand volley for a winner. <coughs> Shades of Tony Roach on grass. Yvonne Lindell's coach. Thirty fifteen. Why, please.
Wait, please. Then they'll give him a hand. Again, John showed the advantage of being able to win to the last minute. With this half volley, Matz gets into position. John waits until Matz inched to his right, and he went to his left. right into his racket. Look, John didn't have to take one step to either side, just pirouette, hit the forehand cross court. Break point. Quiet, please. For the, this will be what, the 20th break if it occurs? 17. 17. <laughs> I, can't, I can't recall a match on grass where there were that many service breaks especially involving John McEnroe. Yes, between players like this, incredible. 16 service breaks already. In fact, the two vocal utterances which have most dominated this match are fault and break point. certainly been very aggressive and very accurate with his returns here lately. That's break points one, eight of 27, eight of 20 for Wielander. So this is the 48th break point of the match. Yes, if you're any place near 50%, uh, you're doing very well. And so they should be a little higher. First service. Other chance for first serve for Wielander. He has in this situation hit some terrific bullets and also short armed a few. Coming the typical service game for Wielander, he fights off two or three break points and somehow manages to struggle through, or he is broken. Another break point. Number three of this game. This is also the time, Jim, when the committee starts to at least give some thought to putting the next match, Mayotte, Edberg, possibly in another court. If this match were to go five sets, they wouldn't finish before seven o'clock. And there was very little chance that Mayotte, Edberg could come on and finish today before the light went down. It may be a moot issue soon. McEnroe with another service break. And the chance now to serve out the match. Now keep in mind that at the end of set number one, first John McEnroe, and then Mats Wielander, both squad.
squandered opportunities to serve out that set, ultimately won by McEnroe in an 8-6 tiebreaker. So now John, who has struggled with the balky serve all day, whose first service percentage has been throughout the entire match below 50%, 43% in fact, in the first two sets, will try to step up and nail a series of first serves. And here now, a look at the time consumed in the match so far. One hour and 57 minutes, two hours and 57 minutes, three hours and 47 minutes. And if you wanted to look at it in terms of how long the ball was actually in play, <laughs> I'd probably say about 15 minutes per set. Time. A lot of that seats walking around minutes. time. Thank 30 you. seconds between points, 90 seconds between odd games. McEnroe won the two sets, which were an hour or more in length. Bielanda won the 43-minute second set. This set is stretching toward an hour. That's 50 minutes plus now. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And John McEnroe will try to bring right. matters to a conclusion and go on thank to you. the semifinal for his deepest thank penetration you. into the tournament since his last championship in 1984. to play his returns right back down the middle, not really going for the lines. McEnroe now with a slight edge in total points won in the match. There have been various moments beyond the 100-point mark when they were dead even. points in a row, John has gone to the backhand side. Why, please? It's definitely the safer serve when serving to Mott's in the forehand court. Maybe he thinks that after almost four hours, Mott's is just a half a step slower with the two-handed backhand. Three in a row to the backhand side. I suspect this is going to go back to the backhand again. Quiet, please. Thank you. One reason to serve, as far as John is concerned, to the backhand side is he comes in and just blankets the right-hand side of the court, leaves it completely open cross-court as if to say to Mats, if you can hit it over there, nice shot. for a gambling McEnroe second serve, or will he just get it in? I think he'll play safe. Yeah! McEnroe getting to the net behind the second serve, and it's double set point. Mats Bielander in danger of extending a string which has seen him through eight years, never making it beyond the quarterfinal at this tournament. This, the biggest moment Thank you. in John McEnroe's tennis life in the past four years. And he hits a first serve. So with the old trademark, 
non-existent through so much of this tournament and through so much of the match. John McEnroe ascends to a level which he has not occupied in the tennis world since a long time ago. of four reported death threats under tremendous heat from the London newspapers once again in so many ways, though not with the serve, the old John McEnroe. And he'll be back in the Wimbledon semifinal for the first time since 1984, where his opponent will be the winner of the quarterfinal match between American Tim Mayotte and Stefan Edberg of Sweden and London, the 